This podcast is brought to you by eRadio. For more podcasts, check out our website on eradiosa.com or download the eRadio SA app from the Google Play Store. Enjoy. It's time for Medical Monday right here on E-Radio. And as always, welcoming Dr. Dylan Joseph. I hope you had a wonderful weekend, Dr. Joseph. How's it going? Hey, Ian, it's been good. Thank you. Uh, good to rest after a long, hard week and uh, back at the office on Monday today. So, um, you yeah, ready for a new week. And how about you? No, good man. Good man. And loving the rain. Uh, that's uh, all I want to say. <laughs> 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 very, yeah, very Irish. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Very <laughs> Irish indeed. Um, right, so today we're talking about macular degeneration. What on earth is macular degeneration, Doc? Well, let's start with the, the anatomical area called the macula. So the macula is at the back of the eye um, on the retina. Now, remember the retina uh, is the light-sensitive membrane, which basically uh, picks up all the light uh, uh, pulses that are going into the eye and then it converts these to an electrical signal and uh, sends it off to the visual cortex or the visual part of our brain which interprets the image. So the macula is the specific area in the retina which is responsible for very fine central vision, so high definition, 3D definition so to speak, um, but fine detail and high resolution colors. Um, so it's often, it's the, it's the part that we use for reading. So uh, we're reliant on the macula for central vision. That's the big word, central vision. Um, and in macular degeneration, this area starts typically uh, degenerating. And it's usually from about 60 years of age onwards. Um, but when it undergoes this degenerative process, it can affect your central vision. Um, and that is called macular degeneration. Okay, and, and what are the risk factors for uh, macular degeneration? Your um, biggest modifiable risk factor uh, is smoking. Um, and it's, it's shown that basically smoking is, is like pouring petrol onto a fire if you have the, the disease or um, if you have the gene for the disease. Now, macular degeneration is genetic. It's hereditary. So it's passed down from your mom and dad. But if your mom and or dad have the disease, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get it. It just means that we need to start screening you from an earlier age. And females get it uh, more commonly than males. Uh, generally, people over 60, as I've said earlier, um, people with fair hair, so lightly colored blonde hair and blue wow. iris, are at a higher predisposition to macular degeneration than the average person. And by default, because it's genetic, it'll always be in both eyes, both the left and the right eye. But it can be uh, in different stages of the disease in the left and the right eye. It doesn't necessarily have to affect the left and the right at equal rates. And the vision can be quite different depending on the stage of the uh, the disease. So, uh, and also our, our southern hemisphere climates where there's a massive amount of ultraviolet exposure, um, UV is a is a big risk factor for this. So we often advocate the use of sunglasses, which we'll talk about later, to try and protect mm. the eye from it. Um, so uh, those are the risk factors in, in, in brief. But the only modifiable risk factor at this stage that we can do anything about is, uh, is smoking. Okay, and uh, I understand there are different types of uh, macular degeneration. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, so there's two basic categories of macular degeneration, the dry form and the wet form. So if we go back to trying to understand what macular degeneration is, I said it affects central vision, but in this area that controls your central vision, you've got very delicate little cells, photoreceptor cells, and the layer underneath that is called the retinal pigment epithelial layer. And these are all really critical in the transmission and conduction of light rays to the back of the brain, where we interpret uh, vision as crisp, clear, um, uh, quality central vision. And if you've got the genetic propensity and you've got a number of other risk factors, uh, basically you throw into this melting pot of where, where you, when you hit 55, 60, uh, you start developing uh, this, this problem, this macular degeneration. And in the earliest form, the dry form, we classified into early, intermediate, late. However, 
um, the cells start slowing down. So every cell in our body uses uh, energy and it and uh, or, or uses fuel uh, for its energy, and then uh, basically excretes the byproducts, the waste. And in macular degeneration, these cells can no longer get rid of the waste as efficiently as they used to. So they start accumulating these white little um, lesions or lumps under the surface of the retina, which we refer to as drusen. So if you've got macular degeneration, you might well hear the word drusen. Um, and this, unfortunately, is toxic to the retina. It causes oxidation. So oxidation is um, a really negative thing for any cell in the body. And that's why ultraviolet is very bad for uh, this part of the retina because it ultraviolet causes oxidation of tissues and smoking does the same thing it causes oxidation of, of tissue and apart from reducing the blood supply to it um, it causes cellular damage and uh, the problem with this is uh, because it's starved of oxygen and this area cannot get rid of its byproducts efficiently it can start developing fine new tiny blood vessels under the area that controls your central vision and these blood vessels are very fragile they are thin they are brittle and they can then suddenly bleed and when they bleed this is called the wet form of macular degeneration um, which is the one funnily enough that we can uh, treat immediately but in, in two classifications broadly you've got the uh, dry form and you've got the wet form what is really important to remember if you do have the macular degeneration whether it is dry or wet uh, it's very important to tell our patients that you will never go blind however you can lose your central vision to a certain extent depending on the severity of the disease but you will never lose your peripheral vision it's not a disease that affects peripheral vision okay and uh, the next one i suppose is a quite a scary question but uh, a very relevant question can i go blind well so the the central vision uh, you know reading writing fine detail uh, which which we become more dependent on as we get older you know 60 70 80 we tend to do a lot more reading than we perhaps did um, and unfortunately when when the disease process gets really bad and into either the intermediate to advanced forms of the dry disease or even the wet disease it can in inverted commas blind your central vision often people then describe a big blotch or a patch in their central vision they say that lines are no longer straight that they lie skew or that there's a kink to them and um, and uh, so your central vision can uh, be uh, terribly affected but once again to reiterate no you will not go blind in terms of your peripheral vision peripheral vision means what can you see on the side what can you see on the top what can you see on the bottom um but centrally it can be affected yes and unfortunately you know to, to a large extent there's not much that one can do to regain that central vision one can use additional magnifying spectacles and prisms etc to try and uh, divert the light rays into the eye but um, it's a very very difficult entity to treat when there's a large amount of damage to the central vision wow okay and uh, let's talk about uh, the tr the uh, treatment dr joseph what kind of treatment are we looking at well our our biggest um, uh, treatment in the dry uh, form of the disease when it's at the intermediate or advanced stage is to look at modifying risk factors so um, ultraviolet exposure to to wear really good uh, sunglasses and um, we look at the um, reducing the risk factors like uh, smoking of course um, and, and and stopping that at, at all costs uh, because when it's in the really advanced form of the dry, dry disease it, it, it carries an exponential factor in converting to wet form uh, with continual smoking um, we often advocate the, the uh, an omega rich uh, diet so um, uh, lots of uh, fish um, and green leafy vegetables and then uh, the age related eye disease study has published a, uh, some good data showing that um, antioxidant rich capsules uh, in the form of uh, reesterified omega 3s as well as zeaxanthin lutein um, uh, zinc uh, iron and a number of other uh, compounds are all specifically formulated um, to try and reduce the oxidation or the stress on the cells at the back of the eye. And these are in very specific quantities. So a lot of patients often ask, well, can't I just take a standard omega-3 or can't I just take this capsule or that or a multivitamin? And the answer is no. It has to be a, 
a, a capsule formulated specifically to target um, the the oxidation and the stress at that that cellular level at the back of the eye, and that's what all these studies have been done uh, done for. Um, and so we prescribe a very specific type of tablet uh, for the dry form of the disease. Um, when you get through to the wet form of the disease, it's often patients, as I've said, will notice a sudden change to their central vision, a big blotch, um, you know, a significant distortion of lines uh, and, and waviness to, to, to letters. Uh, and then we have to consider a treatment called um, anti-VEGF, so anti-vascular endothelial growth factor. So these are injections into the eye that we give on a monthly or two-monthly basis and eventually extend them to three-monthly basis um, to try and, uh, in inverted commas, mop up the blood at the back of the eye um, and also to try and reduce the um, these uh, new blood vessels that are forming or to shrink them, so to speak. Um, it's important to realize and to remember that I think once we get to the stage of injecting, it's not going to restore vision. The primary function of doing the injections is to try and halt the progression of the disease so it doesn't get worse, so you don't lose more central vision. And a lot of the literature shows that on average, once we start committing to doing these injections, most people will be um, getting between 9 and 17 injections over a 18-month to two-year course. Now, there's a lot of development uh, and in terms of those, uh, the modules the, or the molecular structure that we're using in these injections to try and extend the course of the interval between the injections, but um, we still end up using uh, a fair amount of injections. And it's quite frustrating for the patients because they don't see visual gain. But the important thing is to remember that we don't lose further lines of vision. And at the same time, it's very important to take these um, uh, Oxidant, antioxidant-rich tablets that we prescribe as well, and and if you're in the wet form of the disease, to stop smoking as well. If you if you are smoking, even secondary smoking, you know, is as bad as primary smoking. So secondary smoking means someone else in the family um, that you, yeah. that you're in direct contact with, living in the same house every day. That's what we call secondary smoking. Mm. Um, so those are the, the risk factors that we try and um, modify. There are sort of very early uh, developmental uh, projects and, and trials on the go on trying to replace the um, the epithelium that's now, the, the, the back of the eye that's now damaged, and to try and uh, modify genes as well so that we can try and delete the gene so that you don't develop the disease. But I'm, I'm not sure in my career and my lifetime whether this may be a feasible treatment option for our patients, but we can only hold thumbs because that may be a, a massive um, gain for us. Uh, you know, when you're uh, considering certain surgical procedures as well, some of the, the lens technologies available, if you have macular degeneration, um, uh, this lens throws the image off the area that controls your central vision. But you have to have significant vision loss then to be able to use this lens. Um, and, and it basically utilizes the principle of um, having the light rays thrown onto an area of healthy retina rather than damaged retina. So you retrain your brain to use this area to see centrally. And um, there's also very, very expensive lenses. And as I've said, for the really, really advanced uh, forms of the disease. Dr. Joseph, you know what they say, uh, prevention is better than uh, cure. Uh, can I prevent the disease from starting in any way? Prevention is a problem, you know, especially if there's genetics involved. And I think you know, if you do know that a parent, uh, a sibling, has macular degeneration, one, it's really important to see your ophthalmologist and to see your optometrist for screening. And um, two, to try and really modify those risk factors like ultraviolet exposure, make sure that you wear a good pair of ultraviolet spectacles that you can get from your local optometrist. So UVA and UVB rays, so 100% blockout is really important. And a lot of people ask me, well, uh, you know, if their family member has macular degeneration, shouldn't I be taking these tablets? And as I said earlier, the data only shows really from the intermediate to advanced forms of the disease that these antioxidant tablets have benefit. So the answer is no. There's no point in really just taking them if you don't already have the disease. And of course, if you know that a family's member's got the disease and um, you, know, the, the, you, you haven't had your gene testing because you can have it done and you are a smoker, once again, I've, I've said it a, a number of times um, already tonight, 
that is the biggest modifiable risk factor. So um, I would certainly look at uh, stopping that because it could certainly reduce the onset of the disease. And if you do develop it, it would certainly uh, aid in slowing the progression down. Um, but uh, prevention, yes, 100% better than cure, but we've got to look at the risk factors that we can modify, but we can't we can't prevent it, unfortunately, yeah. unless we can mod- modify your genetics. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we haven't figured out to do that yet. <laughs> um, no, not not yet. Um, and uh, Dr. Joseph, also, you know, if you have family members with macular degener- degeneration, I'm sure you are mm. uh, concerned about it, you know. Uh, when should I be mm. seen if, if I have family members yeah. with it? Yeah, very good question. Um, so as most people develop it from 60 onwards, but with a family history, you know, it's a good idea to have a look where, at the back of the eye with an optometrist or an ophthalmologist from about 40. And then um, in your in your 40s again, another couple of screening uh, episodes, and then from 50 every every uh, year to two years. Um, just to make sure that if there are changes, we can monitor it, we can have a look at the progress. We often get a good idea uh, as to whether this is an entity that is very slowly progressive um, or, or advancing quite rapidly. So we can make adjustments in terms of modifying these these risk factors. Um, but uh, you know, basically from, from 50 onwards uh, and in your 40s if you've got a strong family history. Okay. And uh, the last question, uh, quite a big question. Uh, if I have macular degeneration, can I still have laser eye surgery or uh, cataract surgery? Yeah, so let's answer the cataract surgery one first, because I think most people uh, who develop macular degeneration are in the 60 plus group. So the majority of them yeah. will have lens changes, which require in cataract surgery. So the dry form uh, of the disease, absolutely. Initially, we can do cataract surgery. We've obviously got to counsel, consent and warn our patients that if they have lost vision centrally because of the macular degeneration, cataract surgery is not going to return this vision. It's it's going to enhance your perhaps your colours, your contrast, your ability to see a little bit better at night, which is unfortunately one of the common complaints of macular degeneration that the night vision is poor, and and that it enhances peripheral vision as well. But the dry form, absolutely, we can look at uh, um, a cataract surgery when it is in the wet form. It's imperative to first gain control of the leakage of the blood before doing cataract surgery because cataract surgery could worsen that. Um, so we often do a series of three injections initially, have a look at the back of the eye. If it is dry, um, uh, then we can go ahead with cataract surgery. And often with cataract surgery, we can then do a little injection of um, the um, the substance that mops up the blood um, just to try and uh, make sure we don't get recurrence. But we've got to then keep extending the intervals and treating the patient with uh, the injections um, after the cataract surgery. Once again, vital to tell the patients that uh, uh, that it's not to enhance central vision, but um, to try and regain functional peripheral vision. Um, with regards to laser surgery, most of these patients don't fall within the category of qualifying for laser vision correction. As I've said, mostly lens surgery based, but you can certainly enhance uh, these um, the patients if they've got a pr- pretty good quality of vision afterwards that is best corrected, meaning can laser improve their quality of vision so that they may not need spectacles for distance or for reading if their macular degeneration is not too advanced? Absolutely. And 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 patients in their 50s and mid-50s who don't have lens changes and who are looking for more spectacle independence, we can certainly look at laser vision correction to enhance the distance or to consider blended vision. However, once again, absolutely critical that we counsel these patients if they're getting blended vision, meaning one eye more for your intermediate to near, one eye more for your distance to intermediate, that if the macular degeneration becomes a problem in one of those eyes, that they may compromise the vision for that distance we've set you for. So it may compromise your reading vision or it may compromise your distance vision if the macular degeneration gets out of hand at a later stage. Then it means that you're probably going to go back into spectacles to um, to improve the quality of vision as long as the other eye is still seeing well. So it's a little more complex having that discussion with a, a patient with a, with a mm. macular degeneration and even with a family history of macular degeneration, we've got to be cognizant of that. Um, not to say that the patient is going to get the disease, but we've always got to be um, on the lookout for it 
and to follow these patients up carefully. But it's certainly not a contraindication to surgery, but we've just got to be a little more meticulous. Okay. Uh, Dr. Joja, thank you so much. Uh, that's uh, Macular Degeneration uh, for Medical Monday uh, today here on E-Radio. Dr. Joseph, how do we get in touch with you? Um, our local uh, offices are in Neisner and our landline number is 044-150-0085. Our um, website address is www.drdillonjoseph.com and we've got our uh, Facebook and Instagram accounts up and running and uh, we also have a, a great YouTube channel where we can discuss cataract uh, surgery, laser surgery, all our, our podcasts that we've been chatting about are uploaded. So if you've missed the last um, 10 uh, episodes of uh, Medical Mondays and today 11, then um, feel free to, to head over to our YouTube channel and uh, to, to update yourselves on uh, all the topics we've discussed. But, um, and uh, Mariska can also uh, be in touch with you on info at drdillonjoseph.com. That's our um, email address. Great stuff. And then you can also click on the uh, banner on our website, eradiosa.com, of course. And uh, that will Perfect. take you to Dr. Joseph's uh, website. Yeah, that's uh, Medical Monday in uh, its uh, 3 p.m. slot for the final time, uh, or rather its 2 p.m. slot for the final time uh, for this year. And then as from next week, as we go into the festive season, uh, Monday the 29th, then uh, it's going to be at 10 o'clock on a Monday morning. So we'll see you then, Dr. Joseph. Thank you Perfect. so much. And uh, we Wishing you a wonderful week. You too, Jan. Thanks again um, and uh, have a great one. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by E Radio. For more podcasts, check out our website on eradioessay.com or through the E Radio Essay app from the Google Play Store.